And so uh, if everybody that's attending on Zoom will please make sure you're on mute. And if you're present, put your cell phones on mute. And now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Uh, Beattie to uh, make the presentation. So uh, Thomas, if you want to share. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Bob. I will share uh, my screen. Uh, let's see. Is that coming through okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna pull up the chat window and just keep it up in the corner in case something comes up that way too. All right, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's always great. I always like doing, I do a, a decent amount of public talks, I'd say, and I always like doing them to astronomy clubs because I feel like uh, you guys are a much easier audience than doing this to the general public. So happy to be here. Uh, glad to be talking to you all tonight. Um, as Bob said, uh, these days, most of my time is spent working on the NIRCAM instrument on the James Webb Space Telescope. James Webb launched uh, Christmas morning. Um, and so what I'd like to talk to you tonight about is what are we doing with NIRCAM? What are we going to uh, do with it once we finish science instrument commissioning and what are we going to learn about exoplanets once near cam is operational and james webb is all checked out and we start science operations this summer yeah, it's going to advance for me yeah okay so i like to start with uh, a picture like this on these talks um because i like to sort of frame it um, and think about this in terms of, uh, you know, the history of astronomy. And I think in many ways, I would contend that I think you can make the argument that astronomy is probably the oldest human science. It's the oldest science that exists. And by that, I mean that, uh, you know, you could imagine that as soon as people really became intelligent and started looking around them, that one of the first things I can imagine they would do is they would look up at a night sky like this. There's no light pollution at all. It's beautiful. And they wondered what is going on up there? What's going on with the stars? Um, you know, what, what is what causes things in the night sky to look the way they do? And that fundamentally is what we're doing even today in modern astronomy is we are trying to figure out why things look the way they do when we look up in the night sky. Uh, I said I specifically, I work on exoplanets, um, and I think uh, it was probably in, it was the ancient Greeks in about 500 BC who first thought to ask the question, uh, is there a planet like the Earth around the stars in the sky? They had um, some idea of, you know, some theories, uh, the Earth may not be the center of the universe, and so there was some thought given at the time in the year 500 BC, 2,500 years ago, about whether or not Earth was the only planet that had life or if there were other planets like Earth up in the sky. And so really that question, uh, is there another planet like Earth has existed for over 2000 years. And it is only in the past couple of years, the past two decades that we have developed the tools and the techniques necessary to answer that question. And we now have both of those working. We're very close to working. So we are very close to answering that question. Is there another planet like the Earth with life in particular uh, elsewhere in the universe? So after 2,500 years, we right now, everybody listening to me on this Zoom call are very close to actually finding out the answer to that question. Um, one of the ways we're going to do this going forward is using uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. And I'm gonna spoil a little bit of uh, the very end of this talk uh, and um, sort of what I just said. And I'll, ju I'll just say, James Webb is probably not gonna see an Earth-like planet or at least be able to detect life on an Earth-like planet. It probably will be very good at detecting potentially habitable planets, but it won't do a very good job at detecting life on other planets. And I'll talk more about that uh, uh, towards the end of the talk, but I just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, foreshadow a little bit uh, where I'm going with this. Okay, so what is uh, JWST? Uh, I suspect this crowd uh, probably already knows what JWST is, but I'll say that JWST is a space telescope. 
like the Hubble Space Telescope, they're both in space. That has a lot of advantages compared to observing on the ground. You don't have atmospheric effects. You can't get weathered out. Um, the thermal environment is a lot more stable. Uh, that's actually even true as compared to Hubble. Hubble is in a low Earth orbit. Um, that means that every 96 minutes, the orbital period of the Hubble Space Telescope, every 96 minutes, Hubble spends uh, about 48 minutes uh, in darkness and 48 minutes in sunlight. And so you get these huge thermal transients in the Hubble Space Telescope. That actually makes it difficult to observe with the Hubble. So, but James Webb is a Hubble Space, is a space Telescope. The mirror uh, is about three times larger in diameter than Hubble. Uh, so Hubble's is about 2.4 meters, slightly taller than a person. Uh, Webb's is 6.5. Um, so almost three times larger. That makes it almost nine times larger in collecting area. So that means that if you point at a star, you get about 10 times as much light in a given integration, in a given exposure than you do for Hubble. So immediately with Webb, we're doing 10 times better than we would with HST. The, the cool thing for me is that the telescope, the mirror is about three times larger than Hubble or 10 times in area, uh, but it weighs half as much. So we become much better at building telescope mirrors um, in a large way uh, than we did uh, with Hubble. And the mirror here, it's, you always see it colored in this yellow color. <clears throat> the mirror really is, it's coated in gold. It's not very much, it's 48 grams worth of gold that is, it's only a couple of atoms thick over the entire surface. And these are these weird um, beryllium back planes that are present and have this gold layer, this gold surface on top of them because gold is a very good um, infrared transmitter or infrared reflector because James Webb is an infrared space telescope. Uh, Hubble observes in the optical uh, and the visual. Um, well, it goes a little bit bluer, it's actually. It goes into the UV a little bit, and it goes a little bit into the infrared. But James Webb really, first and foremost, is an infrared space telescope. And so that's why all the mirrors are gold, because we need something that's gonna reflect well in uh, infrared light. And regular mirrors, like we have with the Hubble, does not are not as reflective as you would like. But gold is super reflective in the infrared. Um, one thing this allows us to do uh, just for this talk is infrared light by observing in the infrared it means we can see deeper into planetary atmospheres. So this is an image of Jupiter in the infrared. I think actually this was taken with Hubble at the very end of its infrared capabilities. And you can see that this looks very different from the Jupiter that we're used to seeing in optical images. There's, you can still make out the cloud bands, right? You can see sort of the banding structure there. Um, but you can see um, this is color coded, so it gives you an idea of the, the temperature of what we're looking at. Um, the hotter parts here of the image, we're seeing deeper into the atmosphere in those parts. Jupiter's atmosphere gets hotter as you go deeper into it. And so if we're looking at it in the optical, all we see is clouds. We see different colored clouds and different bands, but we see clouds across the entire disk. As we look in the infrared, we get these windows into the deeper parts of the atmosphere, these deeper or these brighter regions on this image that allow us to see deeper into the atmosphere and characterize um, what's going on at different regions of the atmosphere. So we get very different windows into, into planetary atmospheres and we can see deeper into them. Um, another thing that infrared allows us to do is it means we can identify different molecules in um, in exoplanet atmospheres and planetary atmospheres. So Hubble, um, the primary things that Hubble can identify in an exoplanet atmosphere is Hubble can see water. It can get the very edge of methane. It's difficult. Actually, fun story, I uh, uh, submitted a Hubble proposal last year to observe a planet and we said we were gonna try and measure the methane in its atmosphere and the Proposal Review Committee did not entirely believe we could do this because they said it was at the very edge of the um, sort of sensitivity. So depending upon who you talk to, Hubble could do methane or it could not. Uh, it's probably on the edge. Um, and then Hubble can also do some uh, sort of weirder stuff out in the optical, some sodium and um, uh, sodium lines uh, in the optical that give you some information about the, the structure of the atmosphere at very high altitudes. JWST is going to give us very good water measurements. Um, it's also going to allow us to really solidly see methane. You could very easily claim in a JWST proposal that we're going to see 
how much methane there is in the atmosphere. We also get carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, that's not on here, and things like ozone and oxygen potentially. So we get a different set of molecules. So by observing in the infrared, right, I just said, we see deeper into the planetary atmosphere, we see different parts, we get better idea of the structure, and we see different molecules. So we can measure the abundances in the planetary atmosphere much more accurately and more precisely than we're able to do with uh, Hubble. So that is gonna give us a much better idea of what is going on in exoplanet atmospheres using JWST. But, and that's a combination of what I've just been talking about observing in the infrared and the fact that the mirror is 10 times larger in area. So we're not only getting different, you know, a different set of information, we're getting it you know, 10 times faster than we would uh, with Hubble with uh, all that means for the resulting precision we get. Um, James Webb has four different instruments on it. So going from left to right here, the instruments are near spec, that is the primary near infrared spectrograph on um, James Webb, right? Near NIR, near infrared, and then spec spectrograph. Um, near spec, the this the boxes here, it has these four boxes and then all these lines. That's to denote all the instruments here have a lot of different observing modes. So near spec has a bunch of different ways to take spectroscopy built into it. That's representative of all the different ways in near spec you could take spectra. The middle one near CAM with the nice images, um, this is uh, the instrument that I work on. So near CAM is the primary imager on James Webb. So what that means is if you see a picture from James Webb, 95% uh, of the time it will have come from near CAM. So all of the uh, images that have been released so far certainly have came from, come from near CAM. Uh, and near CAM is used actually to do the mirror alignment, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. NearCAM also does have a spectroscopy mode. Um, so we can also do near infrared spectra. And <clears throat> most of what I'm planning to do working on exoplanet atmospheres primarily uses that spectroscopy mode. Ironically enough, I work on the primary camera, like imaging camera for James Webb, but I'm almost entirely going to use it for spectroscopic measurements. All the way to the right in the upper right, there is an instrument called MIRI. That's the mid-infrared spectrograph as opposed to the near-infrared spectrograph. MIRI uh, gives us wavelength coverage, is the longest wavelength coverage instrument on the telescope. MIRI can uh, take observations from about five microns to about 25 microns. So for reference, both near cam, near spec, and I'll talk about nearest, that's the lower right in a second. Oops, Ooh, I'm not gonna touch that. Um, all these instruments, we all operate from about one micron to five. MIRI is the only thing that operates longer than five microns. MIRI goes from about five, 25 microns. Uh, also has spectro primarily spectroscopy modes, but it does have some imaging capability. And then, as I said, lower, uh, lower right is NEARIS, um, which is another uh, infrared instrument um, that uh, has both imaging and spectroscopy. Um, Nearest runs to the shortest wavelength. So nearest can do almost into the optical, uh, the very, very short infrared wavelengths. So it has a combination of infrared and um, imaging modes. And down in the, the lower left, sort of the bottom, the grayed out thing uh, that's labeled FGS, that's the fine guidance sensor. Um, that's really just used for telescope tracking. Once you get onto a target, uh, FGS locks on and puts you into fine track mode and you stay on it. Um, uh, in principle, you know, people are always clever, and I think people are trying to figure out ways you could do science with FGS and observe things, but really it's meant, it's great out here because it's really just meant to uh, allow the telescope to guide. So those are the four instruments on James Webb, and this actually, this diagram here is showing you where they are uh, on um, sort of the imaging plane of the telescope. So if you were pointing at something and you were centered it in near cam, you wouldn't be able to see it in near spec because near spec would be off to the left. You wouldn't be able to see it in MIRI. MIRI would be looking off to the right and FGS and NEARIS would be looking down a little bit. FGS, that's not actually quite true. Well, yeah, because FGS is gonna guide on a different star than what you're targeting on. All right, so what's the current status of JWST? Um, <clears throat> as you all know, uh, we launched successfully Christmas morning. Um, that was a good, uh, very tense half hour of my life from liftoff until the big event 
was coming off the second stage, detaching from the second stage successfully, and then seeing the solar panel deploy. Because after second stage separation, the batteries on James Webb probably had enough electricity for about 15 minutes of operation, maybe 20 minutes of operation. So if that solar panel hadn't come out, uh, you would have had about 10 minutes of troubleshooting and then you would have been dead. Uh, but luckily the solar panel deployed almost immediately, uh, started generating power. And at that point, if anything had gone wrong, you would have had time to actually work it out. But thankfully, uh, nothing has really gone wrong. Uh, the telescope has made it out to its uh, final orbit at the Earth-Sun L2 point. It's one of the Lagrange points um, out uh, about five times further away than the moon orbits the Earth. Um, the, the sun shield deployed correctly. That was a huge thing, um, right? Because you can't, the problem is, is that the sun shield is designed to deploy in zero gravity. That means that what you wanna do is you wanna test this thing as much as you can on Earth, but it's hard to find zero gravity conditions on Earth. So they had all these complicated, what they call gravity unloading mechanisms to try and allow you to run the deployment mechanisms at least in, you know, without having gravity pulling them down. But this whole thing, you know, you're pulling this mylar film taut uh, and that mylar film, you can't gravity unload that. So the gravity's pulling on it. So there are all these tests to make sure it was gonna work, but everybody was still really on the edge of their seats to see if the sun shield deployed correctly. And thankfully it seems like it did. Uh, we know that um, one, because the, the tensioning motors that were pulling it out didn't register any you know, abnormal force on them. They just pulled exactly the way we thought they should pull. Secondly, the real proof is in the pudding, which is that all the instruments that are now shielded by the sun shield are cooling down or have cooled down exactly the way we would expect if the sun shield had pulled out correctly and there were no major tears. So uh, we know the sun shield is working because we've seen it work. All the instruments are now cooling down. NearCam actually is currently, I believe, um, at about uh, 45 Kelvin as of, uh, as of about two days ago. I think we hit 45 Kelvin on our way down to our operating temperature of about 35 Kelvin. So that is um, about minus 440 Fahrenheit record. So everything here is operating very coldly. That's why we need the sun shield because we need to keep the sunlight off everything to keep it down at these low temperatures at their operating temperatures. Um, the, what's going on right now, now that the sun shield is um, operating and, or pulled out, deployed, and the telescope is in uh, its final orbit, is we are currently in the process of doing mirror alignment. So there are all these 18 different segments of the JWST mirror. During launch, those are all locked down onto these rubber they're called launch snubbers under these rubber uh, things to just prevent them from shaking themselves apart during the launch process. So once you get up into orbit, the mirrors are released from uh, their launch configuration. And they're at that point, they're in some uh, kind of completely random position. You don't know how far up and down they are. They're tilted some amount. And so uh, the first, month, while well, we're still doing it, it's taken about a month so far, um, has been mirror alignment to take all these 18 segments that are at these random positions, bring them all up and tilt them in a way to actually create a parabolic surface. Um, so the first part was just raising everything up into their initial positions. And we got this crazy, you know, take an image of a single star and we get this crazy smattering of all these stars. Um, as of about a week or two weeks ago, actually, um, what's called course phasing was complete, which is that now this is on the left. You can see this is an image of a single star taken at that point. So all the mirror segments are now, they're in their correct um, up and down positions, but they're all just pointed straight forward. They're not pointed in a way to create a parabolic shape, you know, like you'd want for a nice telescope, you're getting 18 individual images from each individual mirror segment um, of a single star, right? So this is all 18 segments imaging a single star 18 different times. And you can see some of these are not quite there. The top two uh, aren't quite there. And actually the focus here, I think, is not quite done uh, quite yet, because then each of these individual images are then focused as well as we can. And then uh, as of last week, 
all the uh, mirror segments were pulled together so that now we have a single point. So this image is uh, from last week. It was taken with near cam. Both these were taken with near cam. Um, and we now have a single point of light. So all the mirror segments are now pulled together. We're getting a single point of light from a single star. Focusing is still not complete. So now we have a single star. The problem is, uh, ostensibly, you should be able to focus each of these things individually, pull them together, and you're done. In practice, that never works. Um, so now there's going to be another round of uh, fine phasing to do the final focusing of these, uh, all the aligned images, and to make sure that this stacking uh, still works so we get the best possible image quality. So we're coming up on the end of mirror alignment. So far, everything has been proceeding uh, almost according to schedule, which is pretty, pretty amazing. I feel like the, the vibe, to be honest, amongst the instrument teams is I feel like everybody's just sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop because uh, everything, nothing has gone wrong, pretty much. Uh, I think none of us really expected to get to this point without some sort of major hiccup, and there have been no major hiccups. There have been minor hiccups, right? Um, but everything that's uh, sort of been a problem has been a problem that's been solvable. We haven't hit anything that's been a real roadblock. So here's hoping that things keep going uh, and everything continues to work. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of a view of what it's like in the control center. Uh, this is when I was out in early February. Um, uh, so one, we're not allowed any open containers. You can see there's a Dunkin' Donuts coffee mug that I had to keep it on. They don't want you spilling anything. You're not allowed food either. If you don't want to go out and eat, you have to eat outside. Um, the main places where we sit, right, are these giant four screen computers. Um, when we're running this, we have all these telemetry pages open, which uh, if I'm being honest, let's see, I actually have a better, no, I don't have a better image. Um, it is a lot of numbers and they are, one of, the, one of the things you think about if you're designing this is how do I communicate a lot of information to somebody as rapidly and as efficiently as possible? And so everything that means is color coded. So you see all the green up here, all these green readouts. Um, that's just an easy way to tell if something is good or not. If there was a, uh, a sort of a minor warning, it would start turning yellow. And if there was a real problem, it would start turning red, um, which sounds pretty simple, but it's actually super helpful because if you're looking at all these different numbers, it's hard to keep track if you're just you know, going off the values, what's a problem or not. So everything gets color coded depending upon its warning status. Um, I sit, this is in the, what's called the science instrument room. So there's a whole bunch of us in here. There's probably 20 people in here um, when it's going full bore. The flight operations people sit right next to us in the, the flight ops room. Uh, you can see, I took this picture because you can see in the uh, upper left TV, they're actually just watching Olympic curling while uh, some of this alignment process happened. Um, there is, especially during the alignment process, there's a lot of, I think, waiting because you take a bunch of images and then the wavefront people have to analyze them. So it's a bunch of, you do something for about an hour, you take the images for them, and then they think about them and analyze them for three or four hours, and then you do it again. So there was a lot of time to watch the Olympics uh, when I was out there in early February. Uh, also note, there's two clocks up front, right? There's East Coast time uh, on the left, right next to the curling, and then on the other side of that silver pillar, there's UT time, uh, UTC. Um, which I bring up only to mention that the people, you know, running web is involves people from uh, all over the US and all over Europe. And so it's easier to just run on UT time rather than East Coast time. There's actually, even when you're looking at the telemetry pages, a lot of them also display, they display your local UT time and they display the spacecraft's UT time. Cause we're, the spacecraft is far enough away that we get things about five seconds later just because of the speed of light transmission delay than they're actually occurring on the spacecraft. So when we see something occur on the spacecraft, we're seeing it five seconds ago. So we have our local time and the spacecraft time is two distinct things. Uh, one fun position uh, on the voice loops is the person primary, primarily in charge of the day-to-day -day operations is the mission operations manager. You can see his station, he's not there. Um, uh, over on the, the left here. I don't know if you can read that, the mission operations manager, which just gets abbreviated to mom. Um, so you'd be listening on the voice loop where somebody will be talking about like, oh yeah, I was just talking to mom and he says he wants us to do this. 
So everybody listens to what mom says uh, in, the, in the operations center. Okay, so let's talk about some exoplanets. Um, so just as some background, I think probably most of you guys uh, know this, uh, what are exoplanets, right? The solar system, um, we have planets that orbit the sun. Exoplanets are exactly like that, except they are planets that orbit other stars in our galaxy. Um, all the exoplanets that um, we have discovered are in the Milky Way. Most of them are very close to the sun, uh, within a couple hundred light years. So they're on a galactic scale, very close to the sun, very close to us. Um, the number of confirmed planets that we know about. So this is a diagram. I have orbit size, where the Earth and sun is one down on the bottom, and then planet mass, where Jupiter is one on the y-axis. So this is the number of known planets uh, in 25 years ago, slightly more than that, 27 years ago, 1995. Since the discovery of the first exoplanet around a sun-like star in 1995, uh, we've now really filled out this diagram. We actually now know about 4,500 exoplanets around 3,700 stars. So one interesting thing to note immediately is that those two numbers don't match, meaning we actually know about a bunch of systems that are like the solar system. You have multiple planets orbiting one star. Another thing I'll say about this diagram is, see there's a bunch of points uh, as you go towards the upper left and it sort of peters out as you go down towards where Earth and Venus and Mars are. As you go to smaller planets, it peters out. And as you go to longer periods, it peters out. As you go out to Saturn and Uranus and Neptune, there's not very many points out there. That is not, we think, because there are no planets out there. Both those limits are because it's harder to detect planets at long periods, and it's harder to detect planets at smaller masses. So detecting the Earth around the sun, well, actually, let me, let, let me talk to you uh, about that in a second. I'll tell you how we detect them. Um, so first, uh, we want to know what is the physical size of the planets. We want to know what is their masses and what are their radii. The way we get radii is we use a technique called uh, planetary transits. So this works because if the angle between us and the planet is just right, the planet will appear to go in front of the star from our vantage point. When it does that, we don't see, we don't get this nice image, right? We can't actually resolve the stars and the planets. We don't see them as two separate objects. We just see the combined thing as a single point on our images. But what it does mean is that that combined single point, the star gets dimmer while the planet's passing in front of it because the planet is obscuring part of the stellar disk. The Jupiter going in front of the sun would make the sun get dimmer by about 1% for a couple of hours. 1% dimming for a couple of hours is something that is at this point pretty easily measurable using modern uh, telescopes and modern CCDs. You could probably do it, uh, if you had a good astronomical CCD and good tracking, you could do it with a 12 inch telescope, I think, in a, you wouldn't even have to go to a very dark sky site um, to be able to detect one of these planetary transits. And so this is how we get radii for planets. Whenever we've given a radii for planet, it's been through a transit observation. Um, the way we get masses is using radio velocity observations. So this is uh, also called Doppler wobbling. So here, the planet and the star, we usually think about it as the planets going around the star, right? But really, both the planet and the star are orbiting about the center of mass of the planet and the star. So that means that the planet's going around in this big orbit, but the star is doing its own much smaller orbit in the center. And so we can measure the motion of the star caused by this orbit, this tiny orbit it's going on, using spectroscopy. So we measure the speed of the star over the course of a planetary orbit, and we can use that to figure out where the center of mass is and thereby figure out what is the mass of the planet. Now, I was going to talk about this earlier. The reason why is it difficult to use this on something like the Earth um, going around the sun? Because the Earth going around the sun induces a radial velocity motion. So the velocity that Earth causes on the sun is about 10 centimeters per second over one year. So 10 centimeters a second is about one mile per hour. That's a slow walk. If I was doing this in person for you, I'd slowly be walking to the side right now. So we need to be able to measure a slow walk, a very slow walk actually, that takes a year to complete um, to be able to measure the mass of an exoplanet like the Earth. That's, um, 
that's a very difficult task. I don't want to say it's impossible because actually we're getting very close to be able to do that, but it's it's very hard to do. Uh, okay, so what actually happens though when we find an exoplanet, right? This is a simulated transit light curve of Earth going in front of the sun. And from this, we'll say we get a radius. We know it's exactly the same radius as the Earth. We know it's orbital period because we've seen a couple of these. We know it's around the star like the sun. We know it's at about you know, the same distance as the Earth is from the sun. We know it's the same radius. Let's say we even have a mass. We've measured its mass. It looks exactly like the Earth, right? Um, and now we want to know what is it actually like, right? Because if we did this on the solar system, we did the same game. Uh, well, we have the Earth, right? But we also have Venus in the solar system. Venus, if we were looking at it as an exoplanet, uh, we would also say is an Earth-like exoplanet. It's about the right distance. It's the same, almost the same mass, almost the same radius as the Earth. The problem is, is that Earth is a nice vacation spot and Venus melts your spacecraft uh, 20 minutes after you land on the surface, right? So how do we figure out if we get this measurement, if it's, you know, beaches or if it's um, inferno? And that is where measuring exoplanet atmospheres comes in. So the easiest way would be just to image the Earth, right? Take a nice image. Uh, we got oceans, we got clouds, we got green parts on the land, we got plants, right? High fives, we can all go home. Uh, needless to say, getting an image like this for an exoplanet is difficult, but you could imagine even if you got something that was pixelated, um, you could still make the same conclusions. Problem is, even a pixelated image like this is, um, would be almost impossible to get. Certainly impossible using current our current capabilities. The best we're going to be able to do is get a single pixel for an entire planet uh, for one of these objects. The other problem is that taking a direct taking a picture of a planet like the Earth, you'd have a you'd have the star that this planet orbits right next to it, and stars are very bright. The usual um, analogy that everybody uses to try and you know give you an idea of how difficult this is is it's like you're trying to take a picture of a firefly that is about five feet away from a searchlight and the firefly and the searchlight are in LA and you're in New York City. That's about what you have to do. Um, and actually, I was sort of double checking this. Uh, that's actually not quite right. That's actually an easier problem than taking a picture of the earth uh, around another star because a firefly is only about um, 100 times a million fainter than the searchlight. So it's actually about 100 times easier uh, doing the firefly around the searchlight than doing the Earth around another star. So it's very difficult to take a direct image. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult. So instead, what we do uh, is we use transits and eclipses. We look as the planet goes in front and behind the star to measure what's going on in the atmosphere. Uh, transit observations allow us to get what are called uh, transmission spectra. This is the starlight as it's passing through the atmosphere on, our, on its way to us. It imprints spectroscopically. Uh, all from the atmosphere onto the starlight, and we can measure the atmospheric composition from that little thin ring of atmosphere that we get lit up as the starlight uh, comes towards us. We also do eclipse observations. That's when the planet goes behind the star, and we can do phase curve observations. That's observing for an entire orbit. We see the bright day side rotate into view. It goes behind the star. The, the night side rotates in, and then we see it go into a transit. So all of these are ways in which we measure uh, exoplanets atmospheres using transits and eclipses. Um, the exciting thing about JWST, right? Fundamentally, what we want to do when we're doing this is we want to measure what is the atmosphere made out of. We want to measure the abundances of the atmosphere. We want to know how much oxygen is there. We want to know how much carbon is there. We want to know how much water is there. And James Webb is going to give us 10 times better abundance measurements of these atmospheres. We're gonna have a much better idea of all those things of what they're made out of, and we're gonna have a much wider wavelength range that I was talking about. So what are we gonna learn from this? Um, I'll say we're gonna learn broadly two things, right? We're gonna have a much better idea as a result of this, of how do planets form, and we're gonna have a much better idea of, are there other potentially habitable planets? Not life, but potentially habitable planets. Okay, so let's talk about planet formation. Uh, you could say, if you remember uh, high school or college uh, physics or astronomy, well, don't we sort of understand planet formation? We start with the disk, things stick together, uh, and you turn into a planet, right? You're done. Well, yes, but in, in detail, like, how does that work, right? You can imagine asteroids crashing together. They stick because of their gravity. Tiny dust sticks together because it's just like dust bunnies. 
But like when you get to the pebble stage, if you have a couple of, um, you know, a couple inch diameter rocks that hit each other, how do those stick together? And how do they stick together in a way that means they don't shatter when they collide? That's not well understood. So planet formation, um, we still don't understand in detail how it works. Um, we're gonna get a much better idea by measuring the abundances of exoplanet atmospheres. So on the left, there's a little bit of a complicated diagram, but what I, what I want you to see is the red and the blue. So this is supposed to represent a protoplanetary disk, all that material that's gonna form planets in orbit around a star. And it, you go later, time increases as you go down. So as you get close to the star, uh, you have a lot of water and gas. And as you get further away from the star, it gets colder, the cartoon gets blue, and all the water freezes out into ice. And as the star turns on and evolves, that distance, how far away you need to be, changes. Uh, what that means is that if you form at different parts of the disk, you get different compositions, right? This is showing you water. You'd have much more water if you formed further out than closer in. And there's a, you can do this for a bunch of other elements. That means you can look at the different elements that's on the right in planetary atmospheres. This is it for the solar system. And it's different for different planets. That reflects the fact that they formed at different locations in the disk. So if we measure what's going on in an exoplanet atmosphere, what are the abundances of like carbon, and nitrogen, and oxygen, um, we can try and figure out where in a disk it formed. And by knowing where it formed, we can try and constrain models of how that formation process occurred. So JWST should give us these beautiful abundance measurements, right? We should get very nice um, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, water, all, all sorts of things. Everything you would want to know, we should be able to get from this. It should give us much better uh, handle on where planets form by looking at their atmospheres. Uh, we also want to know about habitable planets, right? And I, I spoiled this at the beginning by saying, uh, well, are we going to be able to detect habitable planets? Are we going to be able to find life? Uh, probably not. Um, the problem is, is what you want to look for is what's in the atmosphere. And this is looking for what are the biosignatures? What are the signatures of biological life that you would look for in a planetary atmosphere to tell if that there was life present? Uh, the two major ones are water, uh, right? Water is uh, uh, present in Earth's atmosphere, reflecting the fact that we have oceans. Um, and really, you'd want to look for oxygen on the Earth. So if there was no life on Earth, the oxygen in our atmosphere would probably be about 0.1% of our atmosphere. With life on Earth, oxygen is about 20% of Earth's atmosphere. So all the oxygen that's present in the air today is present because life is present on the Earth. So as a first pass, what we would want to look for is a little bit of water and a lot, and a lot of oxygen, and maybe some methane um, that's produced as a, as a byproduct from a lot of biological processes. Um, Again, this means you have very distinct spectra, right? Because you have these different atmospheric constituents. This is back to measuring abundances. We're going to use JWST to measure abundances. We're going to measure things like water, oxygen, maybe CO2 and methane. Um, the most promising target for this is uh, the TRAPPIST system. So this is a series of, um, I think this only shows, right? This is only showing seven. It's maybe eight. The eight is real, real iffy. Let's say seven planets around a very small star um, that's pretty nearby. Planets E, and particularly planets F, planet F are, or actually no, sorry, planet E is right in the habitable zone. It's right the exact same mass and radius as Earth, well, close to, almost the same mass and radius as Earth, and it's at the right distance from its star to be at the same temperature as the Earth. So TRAPPIST-1E is a real prime target for looking for a habitable planet. Um, the problem is, even for TRAPPIST, which is probably the best target, uh, almost the best target you could hope for to do these sorts of observations, the signals are very small. So these are simulated JWST observations of TRAPPIST-1C, so not E, right? But even telling apart like a Venus-like atmosphere, uh, and this is using 16 transits and 72 transits, which means that's roughly 32 hours and 150 hours of observing time, which is a lot of observing time. It would be very difficult to tell these two cases apart. Um, that's also true for TRAPPIST-1E. 
So the red here is more of a Venus, two cases of more of a Venus-like atmosphere, and the lower blue ones are um, more Earth-like atmospheres. And you can see on this diagram, you would need 50, 90, 100 uh, transits, meaning uh, 100, 200, maybe even 300 hours worth of observing time to be able to think about separating these and determining what's going on. So that is a huge amount of observing time to ask for. I think the largest large programs are about 200 hours right now. And even then, uh, you know, it's still, I think you wouldn't be able to really nail it to the wall. You spend a lot of time and I think you wouldn't get a really definitive answer. So it's probably better to instead think about this as JWST isn't gonna help us, isn't gonna identify habitable planets. It's better to think about it as JWST is gonna help us identify potentially habitable planets. We're not gonna be, what we're not gonna be able to do is really nail something to the wall and say, yes, that looks exactly like the earth. Instead, what we're gonna be able to do is we're gonna look at something and say, okay, that's, that's consistent with the earth. That's clearly not some other case where it has some giant hydrogen atmosphere, or it's clearly not you know, even something like Venus. So we'll have a couple of objects that come out of this, I think, where we say, yes, this is a good candidate for something that like could look like Earth, and we've knocked a bunch of other, of other targets out of the running. So when we build the next next generation of space telescopes, we can really drill down on the ones that look good, and we don't have to waste our time on ones that we've looked at with JWST, and we know it turns out just aren't going to work because it turns out they have these giant hydrogen objects. So it's better to think about JWST as doing potentially habitable planets rather than habitable planets themselves. Okay, so I'll wrap up there. I'll wrap up with this um, image uh, again. Uh, and I mentioned at the beginning, right, that people for the last 2,000, 2,500 years have been wondering about, is there life elsewhere in the universe? Is there another exoplanet? Is there another planet like Earth? Um, and I was just saying, we're not quite going to get there with JWST. We're going to get very close. Uh, we're going to get very close. But what it does mean is that we are right on the edge of answering this question. Um, and we are really taking not even the first steps at this point. We're taking the middle steps, right, of answering this question. The first steps were identifying the fact that exoplanets exist. We're now past that. We're not, we know the planets are present in the galaxy. We know that most stars have planets around them. Now what we're doing is we are trying to figure out what are the actual planets we are going to look at to try and figure out if life is out there. It's a very exciting time as a result to be doing exoplanet astronomy because we're really working hard towards identifying potential targets for where we could look for life and potentially answer that question that has been posed for the last 2,500 years and answer it within the next 10 to 20 years. It's a very exciting time to be doing astronomy. Uh, it's what gets me excited uh, when I go into the office every morning. And like I said, uh, I, like, I love talking to astronomy groups, but I particularly like talking about this and trying to get you guys all excited about how close we are to finally answering some of these outstanding questions. So I will stop there uh, and I will take your questions. Thank you. Okay, if you're uh, zooming in, uh, I would ask that you maybe use the chat uh, box. And uh, if you're in the audience here, I'd rather you move toward the screen so the microphone will pick you up. So are there any? Are there any questions yeah, I have a question. in the audience? Yeah. So, so I was wondering, what did the FGS stand for? Uh, what does FGS stand for? Right, FGS stands for a fine guidance sensor. Okay. So it's primarily used uh, once the telescope is uh, pointed close to where we want to start the fine guiding uh, tracking process. And, and what wavelength is that? Um, I'm not sure. So it's also in the infrared because all the telescope optics are, you know, covered in gold and geared to do infrared observations. I think I want to say it's like one to two microns, but I'm not entirely sure about that. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, John. Thanks. Um, I was curious if, the, if there's adaptive optics, and if there is, how do they work at such cold temperatures? Right. So that's a good question. Um, so uh, they're not adaptive optics. Um, 
because, uh, well, the whole reason to go to space is we don't need them if we're up in space, right? So adaptive optics on a large telescope like Keck, um, or actually I even knew a guy who was an amateur who he had an adaptive optics system on a 12 inch in his backyard because he'd got this uh, little tertiary pickoff mirror that uh, he could run to run an adaptive optics correction. Uh, so, but all those systems exist because what you're trying to do with adapt adaptive optics is correct for, um, you know, atmospheric turbulence that's above you. Um, and so if you go into space, you don't need to correct for that, right? Um, that's why all these space telescopes just blow all the ground-based stuff out of the water. Um, so we don't need to run adaptive optic systems because uh, we don't need to deal with the, the atmosphere. There still is going to be, um, even after the mirror alignment process, though, there still is, we're going to have to go back and sort of redo that every six months or so just to keep everything in alignment, which you could sort of think of as an adaptive optics-esque event, but that's, you know, on a six month time scale, just to make sure things don't slowly drift. Um, it's not the, you know, sub second, we're deforming the mirror super rapidly that you'd think of on something like Keck or a major ground based telescope. Any other questions here? I'll check the chat box. You're looking at the chat box, right? Yes, I am. Okay. All right. I had a question. How often does uh, the telescope have to do uh, a position adjustment while it's in its uh, orbit around L2? And, and what would its life, is, is that what drives its lifespan, the fuel allowed? Or? Yes, so, the, so that was the original thinking, that the primary limiter on the observatory's lifespan would be the fuel, because we do have to use fuel for station keeping. And when it points to new locations, uh, and actually points usually using a bunch of flywheels that are inside of it, but eventually those flywheels start spinning too fast and you need to use fuel thruster firings and break the flywheels down. Um, so fuel was probably going to be the main limiting factor, uh, but the injection by the launch vehicle, by the Ariane 5 rocket that put JWST into orbit was so good that I think um, the, the latest estimates for the fuel is that the fuel is probably good for 30, 35 years. Um, the expected lifespan, therefore, is about 20 years, because now instead of fuel being the limiting uh, factor, uh, 20 years comes from the assumption that after 20 years, something's going to break just mechanically. Um, so the design lifetime for record was five years. Um, the hope was we were going to get 10. And it looks like we're going to get 20. Um, and the limiting factor on that 20 is because, as I said, presumably the expectation is after 20 years, we'll just start getting mechanical failures. It's not going to be fuel anymore. Uh, Steve Sutton asked in the chat, please explain the focusing pr procedure of the individual mirrors. Uh, right. So during the, um, the course phasing, um, so first we had to identify the individual mirror segments, right? We don't know which segment is which image because they're all jumbled around. Um, and then once they're identified, which is literally by you take an image, you waggle the mirror back and forth a little bit, you take another image and you see which point of your star has just waggled back and forth. That's how you identify the individual segments. Um, but the actual focusing itself proceeds uh, at the, after that, once you've identified the segments, uh, very similarly to how you do it on a ground-based telescope is each individual segment has a motor underneath it that can tip tilt it uh, and piston it up and down. Um, and so you just tilt, tip tilt it into the, and piston it into the right position. You're taking images of this single star and you saw that, uh, that grid of the 18 images. So you just do that individually for each individual image segment until the individual images are all is, you know, close to, you know, perfectly round and in focus as you can make them. Then we pull it all together. The focus, you lose a little bit of the focus there, and then you start changing individual. Um, they're now all stacked together, right? You have 18 images from each segment stacked on, stacked on top of each other. You focus each one individually, run its focus up and down. You see, you know, has that just improved it if I run one segment out? So it improved it if I run it back, then you do it for the next segment. So it's a long process, but that's generally how it works. It's pretty close to how you do it on a ground-based telescope. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I think that 
pretty much covers it. Uh, we want to thank you for such an excellent presentation tonight and uh, wish you good luck in uh, Baltimore. Yep. Thank you, guys. Like I said, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, you can. Uh, we're going to move into the business portion of the meeting, so uh, you're probably freed up now. Uh, okay, yeah, I might sign off. Actually, I have to go pack, so uh, okay. I, will, I will see you guys later. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, I'm going to mute. Unmute myself. Technical difficulties. You turn it off now. Okay. Can everybody hear me on the? Bob, we can't hear you. Okay, so we have our star parties. Uh, we were having them once a month and then with a backup date. But then we had so many people say, hey, let's have another one. So that we've been having like two a month. And we're about one of the only astronomy clubs that have been having star parties uh, throughout this whole last two years. So we're having a good time there. But we want to get people involved, public involved. So we're going to have these star parties at libraries on nights that the moon is like in a crescent phase, okay? Because people love to see the moon. The public loves to see the moon. And when it's in that phase, it's really good to look at. You know, if you've ever looked through a telescope at the full moon, you're going to blind yourself, okay, unless you have filters. So that's our objective is to have public star parties. Libraries will coordinate them. Basically, they've been doing sign-up sheets, so they don't want a whole mob of people coming in. They want people signed up, and they know how many is going to be there. And on top of that, we're going to try to do some more outreach at those libraries. Over the last year, this last, this last year, John, I don't know how many outreach things he did, and we were all over the place. We were in libraries. We were at the trains train park over there in the Cave Creek area. We were all over the place. And that kind of gets old after a while running all over. We don't know what we're up against. Uh, the last one, the train park, we had lights like you wouldn't believe around that place. So uh, we're going to try and narrow it down to like the White Tanks Library, which is quite dark out there. Nice place out there. And the Peoria Library down on Grand. Is that right? The one down there on Grand? And we might do the one up north here uh, up on 99th, off of 99th too. So both nice facilities. 
we did on top of this parking structure and the one off a of grand and we did it in a basketball court over here at this other one so try and narrow us down so we're not running all over the countryside here so and we're going to work with them that way so that's the objective now things coming up uh we have one more meeting this year at this church or this spring at this church it's in april and then in may we're going to have our picnic at beersley park in sun city west just like we did last year we had a great turnout last year for that if anybody wants to volunteer on kind of organizing that i would really appreciate it so uh i'm going to be personally i'm going to be shorthanded again my wife who is currently in wisconsin will be in wisconsin during that meeting so uh, anybody who wants to volunteer, I'd appreciate it. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, we have 50-50 tonight. Uh, are you ready to do it? Number is three four two seven four five. Three four two seven four five. Cool. All right. We appreciate it. Now something else. Uh we've got like four or five telescopes listed on our website. So if you go to our website, uh, I don't know if I can pull it up here. Uh, go to our resource page. I have to go scroll down here just so I'm clear on the bottom. I don't know if many of you get out to our website much, but these, if you just hover your mouse right over that item right there, you'll see this drop down menu and for sale page. Uh, some of these telescopes are for sale uh, when the money goes back to the owner. I'm not very good at this mouse, but we do have we do have two or three of them that are listed that the money comes to our club. Uh, this this is one of them right here. Let me back up here. So it's a it's a six inch uh, six inch right here next star telescope i don't know yeah can they see it now okay this is it right here i think this is at john's house uh and then we have another one right here this was uh dopsinian or a newtonian and i think we got a little mead down here at the bottom too so and we'd love for people that if you're looking for a telescope, just something, you know, these are used or in good shape. This one, this last one, it may need a little help, but uh, it's donated price. to the club. Huh? Look at the price. Yeah, look at the price. Yeah, it's like 250 your best offer. So money comes to the club, helps us out. And most of this stuff is just donated. You know, I get phone calls. People just call out of the blue. I have a telescope to donate. And uh, we've got quite a few that way. So. So if you're looking for a telescope, we have a few out there. Yeah, he's filling up his living room. Yeah, yeah, he's filling up his living room with them. So uh, let's see. If you're interested in our budget and our treasurer's report, I have copies up here. I'm not going to go over them. Uh, we're we're doing good. Uh, we are going to probably sign a lease for this church for the remainder of the spring and in the fall, but we are gonna kind of keep an eyes open for someplace else, okay? So just, just keep that in mind. But maybe one of these libraries, we can work it out. I've got a quick question for everybody that are here. Uh, most of everybody in the club is retired. We do have a few working people still. Does anybody object to coming in, having the meeting start at six instead of seven? Would, would that be working for you? The reason why I'm asking that is the libraries, all, I don't know this, I, it confuses me, but libraries around here close at seven o'clock. 
I mean, I was li library stayed open for quite a while later after that, but they out closed at seven o'clock. So if we were to use one of their facilities, we would have to have a meeting like at six to be out of there by seven. Okay, that's why I'm asking that. So, and I'm going to put a little survey out on a few questions like that, just so I get a feel of how everybody is. So, all right. That could be some tight timing for some of the 